We're going to talk for a few minutes about one of the complicated areas in surgical pathology of the large bowel. Uh, even though uh, we deal very commonly with polyps, um, one of the challenges is the serrated type polyp. For many years, these were just all grouped into the hyperplastic type and felt to be perfectly benign uh, with no need for follow-up. However, more recently, um, these have become uh, the subject of concern and uh, a alter an, al an alternative pathway of neoplasia has been noted in these, particularly those arising in the right side of the uh, large bowel. The term serrated uh, is uh, reminiscent of uh, the undulating uh, surface of a uh, serrated knife uh, that is used to cut bread or other uh, items uh, in a more efficient manner. Um, it's a term that uh, implies a particular configuration and so should be understood to correspond to the outline of the uh, glands in these types of lesions. When we think about them today, we think that there are both the hyperplastic type as well as types of adenomas, and under the adenomas there are two distinct patterns uh, which we will talk further about at, at this time. So uh, these are recognized under the WHO classification. Hyperplastic polyps are still very common, probably the most common type of polyp. Uh, they tend to be flat, fairly small, uh, and generally are distal in the large bowel. They have a very low or negligible malignant potential, um, and uh, therefore the follow-up uh, for these lesions is uh, as would be considered uh, for someone without polyps roughly every 10 years. Uh, the sessile serrated adenoma, however, um, has a very significant uh, um, association with malignancy, tends to be larger, oftentimes more proximal, right-sided, uh, and therefore does require follow-up. It also is fairly common once you begin to recognize and discern the difference between these lesions. The traditional serrated adenoma looks somewhat different. It's much more uncommon, uh, tends to be more pedunculated as well, uh, is mostly distal, and has some uh, malignant potential uh, that is certainly greater than that of a hyperplastic polyp. So these are the reasons that these things matter, uh, and that is that this serrated polyp neoplasia pathway um, is uh, becoming much better understood. We're going to talk about that in much greater detail in the next lecture, uh, but I wanted you to be aware that this uh, neoplastic pathway exists and is something that we need to understand um, relative to the follow-up for these patients. So what do these things look like? Well, generally they are not uh, hypervascular lesions. There's no uh, hyperemia. Uh, they tend to be just very slightly and subtly different from the surrounding uh, mucosa. They may have a slightly tufted uh, appearance, or they may even just appear as a blob of mucus uh, on the surface that uh, doesn't uh, wash away with uh, uh, saline as it's injected through the endoscope. Uh, they can therefore be difficult to detect, although ideally if they're larger lesions, larger than several uh, millimeters, then they would be easier uh, to see. Uh, here we see this pattern of the, uh, uh, and where the name comes from, this undulating in and out, up and down, uh, serrated uh, surface of the polyp or of the epithelium uh, relative to the lumen of the bowel. This can make for some interesting shapes. Here's a little man, here's a uh, shooting star, uh, here's a, a strange uh, dog standing on its head or something like that. Uh, they can be, you can be quite creative with these. Um, <clears throat> now there are some subtypes, uh, the microvesicular type, the goblet cell type, and so forth. 
These are generally not meaningful clinical disti distinctions, and most people don't use them. Here again, the microvesicular type with luminal secretion, as serration, and a few associated uh, goblet cells with uh, associated mus mucin. Notice that the nuclei tend to be basal. They tend not to be enlarged, um, and the cytoplasm uh, is quite clear. Uh, it does have, has very little eosinophilia to it. Uh, this is a more mucin-poor type of serrated polyp. Uh, these do tend to begin at the surface and narrow towards the base. Um, here, rather than having clear cytoplasm, we have a loss of cytoplasm but we still see the characteristic serration along the surface. Um, and so this can be classified as a hyperplastic serrated polyp or serrated polyp hyperplastic type. Now in contrast, as we move towards the uh, adenoma uh, side of things, uh, these lesions tend to be larger. And here you see a both a thicker uh, mucosa uh, in terms of depth, as well as a uh, much greater extent. This is a low power image, and it's obvious that this lesion isn't tapering off. And that tends to mean that these glands are quite vertical. Um, in contrast to uh, the uh, previous lesion, these tend to be somewhat wedge shaped and have uh, somewhat of a, uh, I guess I don't have a low power view, have somewhat of a uh, um, triangular appearance tapering towards the base. Uh, these adenomas, the serrated adenomas, tend to have dilated glands at the base, kind of a broader base, um, and may even show some lateral extension. We'll see some examples of that. Here's an example uh, where you see this nice parallel uh, crypt here. And notice that this is not very serrated. Um, sometimes that is the case. When you see this sort of deep glandular dilatation, or you start seeing branching uh, like this, this is not inflammatory bowel disease branching distortion. This is due to the fact that the proliferation zone is right here near the base of the crypt, but not at the base. And the, thus the proliferation tends to go in two directions, uh, go upwards as well as downwards, and that leads to this characteristic architectural change, which is a dilatation branching at the base, uh, forming boot shapes or duck feet or whatever you choose. Uh, here's another example showing this nice dilatation and outward branching. Here you see the nice serration of the surface and uh, the redundancy. Now again, notice that these nuclei are not particularly crowded. They're not uh, stratified. Uh, they're not hyperchromatic. Uh, they look uh, very much like the nuclei of any other um, colonic uh, polyp. So this is not a diagnosis that you make based on nuclear morphology. This is an architectural change uh, that is a constellation of features uh, that allows you to make this uh, diagnosis. Sometimes it helps to have some clinical information, such as where the lesion came from, uh, in the bowel, what the gross size was at endoscopy, and so forth. So uh, to help you remember this, I uh, wrote a little uh, ditty here, a little bit of an almost haiku. Downward growth like boots or duck feet spreading wider. If it's a polyp, call me back then sooner. These lesions, these bigger lesions with this deep dilatation, serrated change, need to be followed up. Uh, more frequently than um, hyperplastic polyps. Now, in contrast, the traditional serrated adenoma, as we've said, is usually a uh, left-sided lesion, um, and it doesn't tend to pose this differential problem with hyperplastic polyps. Uh, it may more likely be confused with a uh, conventional adenoma at times because you have some loss of mucin and the nuclei become a little bit enlarged, although it's typically fairly bland. The characteristic feature here, however, is this, this sort of inward budding that creates the serration. Um, so in, uh, you know, as opposed to the uh, 
serrated adenoma where the contour of the gland is fairly smooth and the serration is on the interior of the gland. In this situation, the outer contour is fairly smooth, but the serration is along the basement membrane somewhat. Here you see it more pronounced here, whereas this surface is fairly uniform. Here's another example, and here you see maybe a little suggestion of why sometimes these are confused with conventional adenomas, uh, is that there is a little bit of loss of mucin, some suggestion of maybe a little stratification of these nuclei. The feature that helps to make the diagnosis, though, is this sometimes interluminal pattern, but especially if you see these little inward budding nests with goblet cells like this, this is uh, the hallmark of the traditional serrated adenoma. So this is where the genetics becomes uh, critical and understanding what's going, going on in these becomes an important thing. So um, in this situation, there are primarily mutations in two uh, control genes, the KRAS gene as opposed to the BRAF. These are mutually excluded, exclusive mutations that then lead to uh, either traditional serrated adenoma in the case of KRAS or in the case of a BRAF mutation that can be associated with microsatellite instability or other uh, methylation epigenetic issues that we'll talk again about more later. Uh, this can then lead to um, other types of uh, cancer in this pathway. So what you're carrying in your genes, not just in your DNA, but in the epigenetic information can be very important and which mutation you tend to acquire first and in what location matters again. So here we see this sort of outlined here. Um, we'll talk about these pathways again more uh, later. Um, the CIN is the uh, chromosome instability uh, issue. This accounts for a lot of uh, colon cancers. Um, and these are the genes. It's the KRAS gene, P53, uh, APC, familial adenomas, polyposis, and so forth. These are not microsatellite instable, and they are usually along the adenoma uh, pathway. Now, Lynch syndrome also uses the uh, adenoma pathway. Um, and uh, so forth, but it does involve uh, changes where the microsatellite instability is present and one of these genes uh, will usually be silenced or inoperable for some reason, usually due to epigenetics. And these, in contrast, can progress very fast. Their response to treatment is quite different. Uh, the um, CMP um, island methylate, methylation uh, phenotype is, that's what this stands for, is a fairly uh, significant cause of uh, colon cancer as well. Um, and this is a, a BRAF mutation as illustrated in the previous slide. Occasionally there's MSI instability, but more typically this is the, what's referred to as the serrated pathway and sometimes this can be fast as well. So this is why follow-up is so important. So here's kind of the recommended uh, sequence and series for, for follow-up of these serrated lesions. Um, if it's a genuine serrated adenoma that's incompletely removed, so it's removed sort of piecemeal, uh, they need to be back there fairly quick. So if they've taken multiple small bites of a two centimeter or one centimeter a flat lesion, they don't know if they've gotten it all out, they need to go back soon uh, to see what the status is. Um, if it's less than uh, 10 millimeters and there's no dysplasia, then usually you can get away with a little longer uh, screening frequency. Uh, bigger than, than 10 millimeters, they'd like that to be every three years, or if there was any dysplasia, or if there's a conventional serrated adenoma. Uh, if they have uh, the so-called serrated polyposis syndrome, which predisposes them to multiple uh, serrated polyps and therefore higher risk of polyps being missed, uh, then again, they're going to want to follow up that more frequently. So with that, we'll conclude the uh, uh, discussion of the serrated pathway polyp. Um, 
I'll post another uh, short segment of this uh, uh, discussion of colon pathology and surgical pathology um, later this week as well. Uh, thanks for listening.